I like very much this, uh, pick something you love and do it like a bad habit. This is uh, pretty, pretty amazing. I think I've only known about TED for about two years now, and what I'm most impressed by is that it's a chance to, unlike what we do um, as academics and teachers, it's a chance to come by and just tell our stories. And I think there's stories that we all bring, and we bring with a certain passion. And so in a sense, it returns us to an oracular tradition that I think begins to be missing in a lot of what we do as we try to um, be really intelligent about what we do. And so I've approached this just that way, which is to bring you my story, not make any big theories, certainly not give you any manifesto, but tell you about some of the things I'm interested in. So I'm going to start with a story. Um, I, I am an architect. Uh, I'm a designer. Uh, I, I like to design. That's my obsession. That's my passion. Um, uh, but before I did that, I did astrophysics. And in doing that, when I did become an architect and I moved into the field, I was fascinated by different kinds of architecture that were actually related to the stars. And so I became interested in the Aztecs and the Incas and the Pueblos as well. And I developed some very strange friendships as well. So I'm going to tell you Gary Erton's, uh, a story of Gary Erton. Gary Erton is an archaeoastronomer. He's very well known. He teaches at Harvard. And he and I developed a friendship around the Incans specifically. And he has an amazing story, which is the story of Paricatambo. Paricatambo is a very, very important site, an Incan site. It's where one of the cosmogenic uh, origination myths is from. It, and apparently there was a major emergence in this site. The Incans do everything through a clan structure, and the clan structure, it's the work they do, it's the way they socialize, it's the way they negotiate their conflicts. And this is a churchyard and a wall that uh, exists in Paricatambo, and it actually encloses the sacred site. When the Spanish came over, they found the administrative structure of the Incas so fascinating and so effective that they actually kept it and just simply adopted it. The Incans had no problem as long as they could worship where they always worshiped. So, but, but the way they now maintain the physical site, which is the wall and also the churchyard, is that they do it through a clan. Okay. That was supposed to, okay. Um, this is supposed to be a laser point, yes. What's interesting is that each clan is responsible for a different part of the wall. And they're also responsible for uh, cleaning the churchyard in front of the wall. And so you, have, you can see the total personalities of the clans by the wall that they've got. So here's someone who's decided that the rain is a real problem. They'll whitewash the wall. Here's another clan that has built a, a coping on top. These guys are a little bit less effective than some of the others. <laughs> so, and at the same time, this is the wall from the other side. But you really begin to see there are people who have rebuilt the wall and put windows in it. But this is the way that they then, they then do it. It's a little bit like the yards that I grew up in around the Midwest where there were no fences. So you actually had to negotiate who, who uh, mowed the lawn to where. And this is what they do. So what they've done is they've negotiated their entire social structure through this activity, through repairing the wall and, and sweeping the courtyard, and this is my inch, that's your inch, et cetera, et cetera. What's interesting is that in the mid, uh, early 1990s is that the Peruvian government decided this was a really important sacred site, and therefore tourists would want to come here, and so to, they had to clean up this mess. This was just too unsightly in their, in their opinion. So they came in and they built a new concrete retaining wall. They, they destroyed the entire social structure of the, of the, tr of the, of the city. There was absolutely no way anymore for the clans to negotiate difference. There was no reason for them to have communication around this space. And therefore, they didn't have to work. And they went and they basically, they, they drank and they did other things as well. But it really, it destroyed completely the social structure. So why is this interesting? Well. A mechanical system, as you know, is divisible. You can take a car, you can take a watch, you can break them down. However, ecosystems are indivisible because they have these highly developed interdependencies. And what's really interesting about them is that because they're indivisible, every work, every piece of work that happens goes back into the system and changes the system and regenerates the system. So why am I talking about ecosystems? I've kind of moved from the heavens to the, to the earth, if you will. Is it's, for me, what's interesting in architecture are things like Paricatambo, is this notion that we actually live in systems in which social structures, culture, economics, politics, technology, all the things we do are bound up into a system. So for me, space 
and architecture is part of that ecosystem. And I've, I've been fascinated by that, although I didn't know it for many years, but it's driven me onward. So thinking, another thought. Uh, another backstory, which is that when I was doing my master's, when I was doing my, my bachelor's, bachelor's of architecture thesis, I was completely derailed by having discovered these buildings right here. Um, and these buildings, uh, th well, the one on the left you know, Taj Mahal object, I became fascinated with these, these structures that existed in India, which are not object buildings, but are actually much more complex systems. They are structures in which there are all sorts of interrelationships between different pieces and parts. The way they're occupied is much more complex. There's a lot of ambiguity and ways that you can use these buildings. So I discovered a series of, of buildings which were much more like what I had seen happening at Parikatambo. So games, which is really the topic I want to talk about tonight. Uh, Marcel Duchamp was a, obsessed by chess. He stopped theoretically doing art, art for about 20 years, which he actually didn't stop doing, but he pretended to stop doing. Um, and in uh, 1971 and 1975, he gave two interviews about why. And for him, what was really, really interesting in chess, his obsession was all about the kind of visual plastic nature of the game. The other thing that fascinated him is he was not so much interested in the geometry of it, but he was interested in the mechanics of the system, the way that you move through the system. At the same time, Lewis Carroll wrote Through the Looking Glass, based upon an 11-move game of chess. Everything in the book is defined by those 11 moves, the way that the characters move through the book, the way that they relate to each other spatially, the way that they relate to each other hierarchically, and even character development in the book runs through the logic set up by the game of chess. So what's really interesting to me about these two people and the way they look at it is that it really underscores three key characteristics of games. Games by nature are rule-based. They're usually just a few sets of rules. They, the rules are static. They're absolute. You have to keep to the rules except when you're cheating. Um, yet at the same time, gameplay itself is dynamic. It's improvisational, and it's basically infinite in the kinds of uh, the chess games that you can play in the way you move through the system. As you're playing a game, everything, everything you do is a choice. Every move you make is a choice. Every action you make is a choice, and every single choice feeds back into the system, changing the future of the game as it moves forward. It is an ecosystem. The second thing about these games that are so incredibly fascinating is that the, the choices and the games themselves are a system of logic, manifest in rules, but they're usually based around a narrative. And that narrative or story, whether it's chess or whether it's a medieval narrative or it's an ancient narrative, is the way that that logic, which is a mathematical logic, transfers into material form, into pieces, and boards, definitions for the pieces, definitions for the relationships of the pieces, and how they work in the environment of the board. And this is really fascinating. The third thing that intrigues me about games is that they are profoundly social in nature. And they work at three scales. Because they are narrative-based, those narratives are constructed out of society. They belong to the real world, but when they move into the game realm, they become an imagined new world. So they construct society, and they build society even before society oftentimes knows that it's, it's, it's um, how it's going to evolve. They evolve with society. So they're profoundly social that way in how they bring the real world into the imagined world. They're also profoundly social in the kind of physical and gestural aspects of them. You play a game with somebody, and you're in each other's space. Oftentimes, two people are opposite each other. They're also profoundly, profoundly social in that they are a means of negotiating conflict. By nature, all games are conflictive. Someone has to win, which means the others have to lose. And, but you negotiate your relationships with others, your personalities, and all that through the game space. So another opportunity I had is that I was in uh, Chile, and there is a city being built down there by poets, artists, architects, totally engineers, totally multidisciplinary, and that city has been constructing its identity through gameplay 
specifically cards and poetic acts. And so what, what's very, very important about this is once I went down there, I began to actually become interested in games in a more profound way. And this is when I actually decided to start using games in an architectural studio to see, well, not even to see. I think at, at the beginning it was just an instinct. What can I do? This is fun. This is crazy. This is kooky. We have 14 weeks instead of 10 weeks. So you have to do something with the four weeks that you have when you have semesters as opposed to the 10 weeks when you have terms. So we always did something at the beginning. Sometimes that actually found its way into the design problem, but not always. So I set about looking at games, playing games, designing games, and then looking at architectural projects. So there was a quick question that Ruth had when I was presenting before, which is what is an architectural studio? An architectural studio is a space, but it's also a community of practice. It's where 40, anywhere from 11 to 14 students meet three times a week for four hours in a tutorial environment. They get a project or problem that they're working on, and they work on it individually. They each do their own project, but at the same time, they are sharing their results. They're debating the problem. The professor is the mentor, helps them debate the problem. They learn to critique themselves. They learn to critique each other. It's a very dynamic en environment, but it is not a team environment. It is a kind of individually based environment. So what, what I, so the studios evolved this way. We played games, we analyzed games, then they designed games, and then we actually did architectural projects. At the beginning, it was, it was interesting. That's about the best I can say for it. The games were gorgeous. They, the students loved the games, no problem with that. Then they would do the architectural projects, and at the beginning, there was no correlation whatsoever from one to the other. But after two studios at Cornell and three at MIT, I began to see that the minds of the students were changing. They were picking up other skills that I had not expected very, very tacit skills and kind of complex ab ability to deal with complex problems in a more interesting manner. So I'm just going to run you through the way we did these very quickly. Corridor is an interesting game. If you look at any complexity chart where they do the math of how complex a game is, corridor is theoretically more complex than chess, but less complex than Go. Go is the most complex game, also has the least rules. Corridor, you either move a ball or you put down a gate, and the object is to get from one side to the other. That's it. So the students would play these games, they play these games for a week, then they map these games. They map these games through time. We use information theory to help them understand how do you collate information. And this one is uh, just a simple one player, the other player, the lines are a move, the circles are a gate going down. And you can see what's interesting in these maps through time is that clearly you can see the dynamics of the game. There's a lot of... There's a lot of activity at the beginning, then there's a moment, the bigger circles being bigger impact, then there's a moment of quiet, and then there's this flurry of activity at the, at the end. This is the move that theoretically changed the game. So here's another, another map that the students would produce. I won't explain that to you. Um, StarCraft, another game. This is a very, very beautiful uh, map that one of my students did. StarCraft is an online game. You play in real time. You go out and you, uh, you basically amass lots of wealth and you try to kill the enemy. Um, you can change your environment while you're doing all of this. It's a little more complex than that, but that's kind of the, the key line. Um, and you change the environment as well. This map is probably one of the most beautiful ones that's been done for me. He is mapping the time here, the amount of resources garnered there. This has to do with the resources built up. This has to do with the uh, resources you lose as you go through. These uh, have to do with uh, skirmishes. That, that are, what's really fascinating about this map is that not only do you see the dynamics of the game, not only do you understand how it's played through time, but you begin to see strategic packets happening, where one of the players said, I'm going to try to do this, but um, it didn't work, so now I have to change my mind. They have to improvise. They have to change it based upon what somebody else's strategy was doing as well. In addition, you see the personalities of the players. This player was always testing the other player with his battles, but he was not amassing enough forces that... Oh, Apologize. Um, whereas at the end, amassing, amassing, and then one final obliterating battle at the end. So it's amazing. You see the dynamics through these maps. You understand the personalities. You understand the strategic packages. And you understand the moments of greater impact in the game. So then we go into game design. 
And in game design, as I said before, the narrative is the organizer of the game space. It is about how the real transfers into the not real. We always use, um, is so they don't have to come up with their own kind of storyline, we often use uh, film and other uh, elements that bring in the kind of, uh, shall I say, base information of the design problem we're gonna do later. This was when we did a Shanghai studio. We were looking at two films, one by Zhang Yimou and one by Liu Ye, um, and that. So there are basically four elements that they organize by the story. The narrative organizes the pieces themselves, in other words, the material elements. At the same time, it organizes the definitions of those material elements. The rules also create the relationships between those elements and then the environment of the game board. This is probably one of the most beautiful games that's been designed for me. Um, Stones, 16 stones, each stone has four binary properties. It can be big or little. It has either yellow or white lines on it. Those lines have a directionality, and at the same time, they have a num numerology. They have numbers to them. What you do to play this game is that you try to get four characteristics in any direction. It doesn't matter which direction. And you can, when these line up, you can move in this direction. If I turn, those lines par parallel, I make a gate. The interesting thing about, and then this is a, an incredibly beautiful uh, bamboo ball that he made that you have to squeeze to get the game out. The interesting thing about the game design is they start with a narrative, they make their rules, it's a disaster. They play the game, it's a complete and utter disaster because the rules are too complex, the game takes too long, you can't cheat, and it's no fun. And if you, this is a totally unsuccessful game. So they, they, they're all, they, they just, they're totally distressed. And then they start playing and designing with each other. So instead of designing alone, two or three will get together and they'll say, let's try this rule, let's try that rule, let's try this rule. And little by little, without them understanding or working on it explicitly, working tacitly, they begin to create these amazing, amazing games. And this is that moment of rewiring, if you will. They have to make these games physically, they have to write the rule book, and then they have to create another map. And as I say, this is you, the, the kind of gesture of squeezing this and dumping out the stones because games are about sound, they're about, because you're using your, hand, your hands, they're about cold, they're about warmth, they're about all of the things that make it pleasing to do. The more successful games have less rules, the more successful games are just physically delightful to play with and they, they don't last too long and yes, you can cheat and they have numerous amounts of play. From there, the students then go, and I'm not gonna explain these projects, but they go to do a series of projects. What is interesting or what's happened the last two times is that the projects I've now put forward are more complex projects. The projects are framed not through, here are your parameters, solve this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Instead, I set the problems up as a series of uh, questions that frame the issues around the problem. And the beautiful thing is if a game is an ecosystem, if the mentality that we're able to create is about ecosystems, then each time they ask a question, they propose a solution, it doesn't work, or they ask another question that's different, it feeds back into the system and it changes the whole system. As opposed to linearly saying, let me solve this, let me, let me solve this, and let me solve this, and then let me solve that. And that is the beauty of it. So what has happened over the years, and this is an interesting, and again, I focus on complex problems that are rich, uh, I think the problems of today are complex. They're culturally, environmentally, technologically, politically, economically rich. And this is really the motivation for me in doing these. This one project, which was done actually here at OSU, um, was about how do we establish within a rural environment, how do we hold on to all of the, um, in, in England, how do we hold on to all the characteristics and how do we begin to urbanize it without making it into suburbia? So he basically looked at the social ecology, the, um, the building ecology, carbon neutrality. There's a whole thing here which is amazing about if I build one unit of construction, I can offset the carbon of that. If I use this, I need one and a three quarters. So basically different materials 
different materials have different amounts that they need of, of units to offset it. So you begin to play it, and then there's lots of other rules that have to do with social ecology as well as the other. And so the site plan doesn't come out to be a cul-de-sac with lots of you know, houses in a certain way. He plays off of, there are, there are um, houses in there. It really has to do with, as you begin to set it up like a game, who, goes, who builds first, how many units do I need to offset my carbon, then if someone builds near me and they can see me, what do I have to do? And so you're constantly changing. It's a very living kind of ecosystem that he devised. Um, this is a really interesting one. I won't go into the story, but it was a story about Al Al uh, Talo Calvino, the chase. At first, he decided the game should be linear because it was a linear story, and then it became something completely different. And it had to do with a predator and prey, so the project ultimately was to take a kind of um, a, a ghost town and insert a cat and mouse game within it. Uh, and this is actually a project that I did with some students at MIT and Valparaiso. I've been doing a lot of work in South America and Asia in kind of precarious settlements. And this is a project that we started, but now it's becoming part of the Media Lab as well. So what's interesting about this is that while I started it not quite understanding what I was going to get, what I got was a lot. And these are just testimonials by the students. Had I told them, starting out, that I was going to get them designing complex, dynamic, emergent systems, they would have said, forget it, I'm not taking a studio, I'm going somewhere else, this is way too difficult. The issue is that by doing it through gameplay in a way that was actually fun, they were able to create, to, to develop a tacit skill to do this thing um, that then fed back into the design project. As I say, I never ever said, take the design work from the game and translate it to the architectural project. I merely gave them an architectural project and because they'd been rewired, they began to operate in a very, very different way. I have to say the OSU students did some of the pro best projects of, of, that, of all that I've done. So another testimonial, the idea of you know, tremendous, tremendous skepticism at the beginning and then finding that they had developed a skill that they really did not anticipate at all. So what's interesting about this, I think a bunch of us are, you know, have been talking about learning, we've been talking about learning in the 21st century, and what do you do to, to you know, how do we approach this problem? And a lot of, uh, you know, some of, some of us are looking at this notion of, you know, human who knows and human who makes, and that absolutely today we need to put those two together. Because in putting the two together, we deal with the explicit sides of learning as well as developing tacit skills. By creating communities of practice, you know, learning to be a mathematician by being mentored by a math mathematician, by doing math as opposed to learning how to do math is very much part of this discussion. But I would suggest that actually there's a third part to that triangle and absolutely we need to add back in Homo Ludens, man as player. And it's not because we should have more fun in our lives and it's not because it would be great to, to, to enjoy ourselves more. It's because through play, as I say, there is a profound relationship to, to culture, to society. There is a profound material a component. There is a profound relationship to our technologies and to how we evolve these ecosystems, yet at the same time, it's not scary. You know, the fact that they were playing games and for them it was really, really, really fun, it kept that from being a difficult scenario. Games like the oracular tradition have been part of our society for so long. We have lost, I think, um, their value because we've devalued them to entertainment and recreation. And so this is, is what I would suggest. That is, it is really through homo ludens. We can solve problems through homo sapien. We can make things and innovate perhaps through homo faber. But I would maintain that the imagination is only really engaged, uh, engaged through us beginning to transfer the reality we have into other kinds of thinking about what we can imagine. And we can do it without any difficult, dangerous repercussions if we do it in play first. And so that's is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>